Man, what's going on, y'all? Who it's been uh, an eye opener? A lot of stuff been going on. Uh, nothing negative, you know. Every a lot of things, everything positive, you know. Just enlightenment. But um, you know, uh, of course, I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter seven today. But I wanted to give you guys a you know a little bit of tidbit of uh, things that have transpired. Not a lot of information, but uh, just uh, a prerequisite. But um, we always start off with prayer. Y'all know me. Knowledge the Raven. Knowledge the Prophet. Minister Knowledge. Brother Knowledge. Some call me Preacher Knowledge. Um, but uh, the 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 names of those things they, uh, they don't matter. You know. Uh, to me, I don't look at them as titles because I know what they truly are. They're offices, but uh, I'm just a, a man. I'm just a mere vessel that uh, is being used for the Lord. That's it. I'm not trying to be perfect, and I'm not out here to explain myself. I'm just telling you that I'm just uh, a righteous man, and I, I want to live my life right. I want to uh, live righteously. But um, Father, we thank you for um, today. Thank you for. Uh, what you've done for us, Father God. Thank you for your grace, your kindness, and your mercy, Father God, your love, your unchanging hand, your everlasting love, Father God, the, the love that you give us even though we don't deserve it, Father God. A lot of things that we do in life, you know, we um, we feel like there uh, there is no consequence. And there is a consequence, Father God. We know that. I know that. Uh, that there's consequences for everything, Father God. So that's why I uh, choose to live our life, or my life differently, Father God. And I choose to spread your word. And I thank you for it, Father God. I thank you for uh, allowing me to live to see another day. Another day that wasn't promised, but a day to uh, spread, your, spread the message, to spread your word, Father God, and to pour into your children. Lord, I pray that the word that comes forth today be a word from you, Father God. The words that flow from my mouth be nothing but you. Words of power, words of love, words of a sound mind, words of faith, uh, words of wisdom, and word of knowledge, Father God, in the true word. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit comes in and just uh, pours into the people. Holy Spirit, give me the knowledge, the wisdom, <clears throat> and the understanding to know the difference of what I'm reading. And also to, for the viewers that are listening and watching, Father God, I pray that they receive the same thing. In Yeshua HaMashiach's holy Mighty precious name we pray. Amen. So, uh, today, you know, I went and I talked uh, with the mother of my children. And we had a conversation, deep, deep conversation about, um, you know, our children and about our lives and how we are now. But, um, <clears throat> How, how far we have come and it's nothing but God. You know, she told me that, you know, when we were together, she always prayed for me, always hoped the best for me. We didn't, we really didn't have uh, the proper tools to be with one another, but we still uh, loved one another and we still prayed for one another. Even, even though, you know, she was praying for me, I don't know if she know that I was praying for her as well. But, all I'm saying is, is that, you know, what she told me today was that she saw the transition. She saw the fight that I was up against, the fight of, of, of good and evil, you know. She saw the old me battling with the new me today. But back then, you know, I didn't recognize it because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't recognize that I was going through a transitional phase of being this man that I am today, you know, <laughs> I'm not perfect, I'm just righteous, and I choose to live my life right, I, I choose to speak right, I choose to love uh, what I call is right, which is to love everybody, I choose to do what's pleasing to my father and not what's pleasing to man, and I just thank uh, God that she was able to say that today, even when she texted me last week and asked me uh, to forgive her, and as I told her then, I forgave you a long time ago, you know, and uh, I know that she's forgiven me for the things that I did in my past, but just like me, I'm not my past, she's not her past as well. And I won't hold nothing against her because I know that, I, I know the truth, I know that she has a great heart, 
and that she means well and everything she does. She's just been through some things and she just needs some support. And, and what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is because that's a lot of us, you know, that's how it should be. We should just be supporting one another and helping one another. And uh, instead of, uh, you know, coming into somebody's life to, to tear them down, using everything that they told us that they had an insecurity for to, whenever we get upset, feel like that we could just say whatever we want to them and not have any remorse for it. And like I told her then, you know, I apologize, I'm sorry. Uh, and please forgive me because I didn't know that I was... Uh, doing these things to you. It wasn't until they started happening to me that I realized that I was messed up and I was uh, saying a lot of things that I should never say. But that's why now I choose to say the right things. And I, no matter what anybody says, that is the mother of my children. I'm gonna always treat her as such. She's not gonna be treated like an outcast or like, um, like you know, she doesn't belong, like she doesn't have a place. No, she's going to be treated with the utmost respect as the mother of my children, as the one who gave me children, and nothing's going to stop that. Nobody's going to stop that. And, and we are great friends. And at the end of the day, hey, doesn't matter what anybody says to me, I'm going to keep on doing it. Hey, what's going on, Chris? So uh, today, uh, like I'm just telling y'all, man, to be, to be honest with you, yeah, don't don't tear anybody down anymore. You know, if it's your the mother of your children, the father of your children, no more of that stuff, man. Let's start lifting each other up. I don't care if they continue to do you wrong, still pray for them, stand in the gap for them. That's the best thing that you can do is continue to pray for them. And praying for them don't necessarily mean you gotta be with them, necessarily mean that you gotta deal with the BS. Just let God deal with it. Let go and let God. All you gotta do is just stand in the gap and pray for them and hope for the best. That's all you gotta do. Steady, just love them anyway. Love the hell out of them. But um, today we're talking about Acts chapter 7, uh, and it's Stephen's speech. The speech, uh, this this speech, from the other day we talked about, you know, Stephen, they had arrested Stephen, or as they say in the book, they seized Stephen and put him, seized Stephen and put him in, uh, in jail or in prison um, for preaching the gospel. So, this just goes on to say what Stephen's speech is next. So this is what Stephen chose to say. Or this is what the high priest said to Stephen. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Herod. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are living. So Stephen is giving them some, some, some uh, specifics of history. He's giving them some history, some background. This is his defense of, um, you know, according to the high priest. This is like, he, he's basically, um, how do you call it in court? Uh, he's defending himself, you know. He's his own lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, let's see. What was I? Uh, God removed him from there into this land in which you are living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. Though he had no child, and God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. So uh, that's going back. Like he's basically telling them, he's giving them the history. And if some of you don't know, the history that he's giving them is the history that we're living in today, which is the 400 years. We're actually out of that 400 years. Um, it just came about, and that was August 2019, uh, Project 16 and 19, which the 400 years 
of enslavement is up. So now we're in what you call a census. Um, let's see. What was I? And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs or the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel. Let's see. And let's read it in the. Um, and this is the study Bible. Abraham himself was given no possession in the promised land, not even a length of a foot, showing that God was working even when the temple did not yet exist. So God was working even though the temple didn't exist. God had promised Abraham, you know, that he would be the father of all nations, that he would be the father of many, and he would be the father of like when he told him to look up in the sky and he said, can you count the stars? <laughs> That's how many children that you will have. Like, I, and I'm thinking, like Abraham, like, man, I can't count all them things up there. And God was like, That's uh, going to be, that's how many children I'm going to give you. And uh, 400 years, that is the time Israel spent in Egypt. And that's the time that we're living in now, or we're living in. You know, they spent 400 years in Egypt and there's 400 years for us. This is like basically Egypt for us or what you call Babylon. Still enslaved, enslaved in your mind. Um, now in verse 7 it says combining, you will combine basically Genesis chapter 15 verses 13 through 14 with Exodus chapter 3 and 12. Stephen spoke of God's assurance to Abraham that even after a long exile, his descendants would come to Canaan and worship God in this place. Stephen's emphasis was on how God revealed himself outside the Holy Land and how he promised a place of true worship to come. So in a nutshell, he's given all of this, this history, all of this background. He's telling him like, this is why I do what I do. And this is why, well, I'm not gonna give it, up. let's read on. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and, re and rescued him out of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. That's, that's pretty much the same thing that we're going through right now is you know um there it's like a famine right now you know all through the whole world hey what's going on uh through the whole world and you know i see people out here right now struggling to find food struggling to get a job struggling to to keep their head above water struggling to to uh, feed their children and all these things and it says that so is the day of noah it will be again and we are literally in that time um, but when Jacob heard that there was no grain in Egypt, he sent out he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died. And or, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had brought for a sum of silver or bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Harmer and Shechem. Now, what we're reading here, this is what Stephen is reciting. He's reciting basically the story of Moses and uh, is in three parts covering 40 years, each birth and years in Pharaoh's court um, from Egypt and sojourn in Midian and divine commissioning at Sinai and wandering in the wilderness. Man, it feel like we straight up in that time, like everything that I'm reading, it says Moses' education in Egypt and uh, Egyptian wisdom is not mentioned in the Old Testament, but was well established in a Jewish tradition. 
Stephen emphasizes that one who delivered Israel was educated in a secular setting, hence God accomplished salvation in an unexpected, in an unexpected way, as he now done through Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, or we, you know, some you know him as Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, let's see, where were we? But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. They killed him. They killed him. Now, if you look at it in this sense, you can see that same stuff is happening today with the, uh, the black men. They're being killed. And it's, it's sad because the same stuff is going on. And it's not just, you know, officers and pe uh, people that's not of color that's killing us. It's the people of color that, uh, that's killing each other as well. It's the black man versus the black man killing each other. But I'm not going to go into that, you know. Um, Where was it? Oh. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. In verse 23. This is where Stephen is telling this story. He's giving all of this knowledge to the high priest. Stephen highlighted Moses' middle years by relating his avenging of an abused Israelite and the su subsequent rejection of his attempt to reconcile two quarreling Israelites. The 40-year period was spent primarily in Midian, but Stephen chose to emphasize the single incident because it illustrated Israel's constant rejection of its God-sent leaders. That's basically what we're getting to, is that it's still happening today. They're still rejecting God-sent leaders. God sent, God's chosen people, they're still rejecting them. We're still rejecting them. But God is doing some moving and some shaking and some things. I'm telling y'all, if you ain't heard it before, you hear it again. He's doing some moving and some shaking of some things, putting people in place, like as if you were on a chessboard, moving things around. And I'm going to tell you as well, man, you know, I, you know, it was told to me, and I also heard it before. I uh, actually heard it again, but it's going to be a lot of uh, death going on, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to start happening. And just, just get prepared for it. You know, be ready. I don't know if you watch the video, if you listen, but take heed to what I'm telling you because it's going to start happening. Um, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in the words and deeds. Moses was raised up by the Egyptians, so he learned their their ways. He learned the ways of the Egyptians because he was brought up as an Egyptian, but he was a, he is a Hebrew Israelite, but he was brought up as an Egyptian, so he didn't even know himself. Where was I? Oh. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the opposed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. They did not understand. Hmm. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. 
Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside and said, or so he pushed him aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Like, who made you boss? Who are you? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this resort, Moses fled because he heard that. He fled and became an exile in the land of Midian where he becomes the father of two sons. This is where Moses took off because they basically fronted him out. Like, man, who is you? Like, who who died and made you boss? Who you tell me not to put my hands on my brother or to uh, fight against my brother? Didn't you just kill somebody yesterday? So Moses fled. Now, when the 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. Now, we know that this angel, when you uh, read it, is nothing but the Holy Spirit, nothing but God, nothing but the Father, Son, Holy Spirit at this point in time. Uh, the Trinity, let's call it that. Um, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers and the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So Moses was scared. He feared this voice that he was hearing and this fire that was uh, burning. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, come here. I will send you into Egypt. I will send you back to where you came from. I put you there in the first place is what God is telling. I put you there in the first place to learn the ways of these people. To not just learn the ways of them, but to be around your brothers and your sisters, your people who are the slaves. Now, I'm sending you back there because you know the ways. You know how to get to them. They know you. So I'm going to send you back to deliver your people, which are my people, out of Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give us. Oracles. Hmm. What is that in 36? So Stephen continued the story of Moses, emphasizing Israel's section of his leadership. His implicitly presented Moses as a type of Christ. Both were men whom God sent. Both served as a redeemer and both performed wonders and signs. The only way you can do that, again, wonders and signs, those are miracles. Those are gifts from the creator, from God, from the Holy Spirit, from Yeshua. Excuse me. Christ is the prophet whom Moses predicted. So at this point in time, when Moses was talking, he was talking about another one coming forth, which would be Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the uh, Redeemer, the Messiah. Uh, where was I? Oh, here it is. He received living oracles to give us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what 
has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me to did you bring me to slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephim, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into an exile beyond Babylon. Babylon is America. It is. <laughs> it truly is. It's the United States of America. It is Babylon. Um, our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, uh, directed him to make it. According to the pattern that he had seen, our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet says. So understand this. God does not dwell inside of buildings. God is on the outside. He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's whenever you look outside and you see you see nothing but God. The trees. That's how you know it's God. The grass that grows. He makes sure it's water. He makes sure all the seeds in this earth realm are water. He makes sure the birds eat. He makes sure every living thing on this earth eats because he created it all. So, again, it says it, and I'm going to read this again. Yet the Most High does not dwell in the houses made by hands as the prophet says. And I'm going to tell you what it says on that one. Now, Stephen quoted this to establish that God does not dwell in the houses. A point Solomon himself made in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Israel's error was in confirming or confining God to the temple further. Stephen suggested that neither the tabernacle nor the temple were intended to last forever. Both pointed to something greater that was to come. And that's the same thing today is God does not live you can't restrict God into a box. You can't restrict God to uh, uh, to what we call the church, which is a building, a gathering place. You can't restrict him there. You have to get out. As you can see, Yeshua, I mean, he was taught in synagogue. He knew all those things, but they found him on the outside. You didn't find him preaching and teaching the word in a building. He was on the outside. And they still didn't know him. They knew of him. They knew from, you know, from King David. They knew from Moses. They knew from Abraham. They knew from all these other um, God sent people or prophets, seers. Heaven sent. But they still didn't know of him. Not until he died. That's when they recognized who he truly was. As a matter of fact, it was when he died and then he rose again in those three days is when they truly realized who he was, which is the Father who came down from heaven in the form of flesh. We call him Yeshua HaMashiach. The Western civilization calls him Jesus Christ, Jesus the Nazarene. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all things? So God is like, so all you, I made everything. So how can you restrict me to a building? I made it all. I don't live there. I don't dwell there. I'm 
everywhere. But you can't compartmentalize me. You can't put me into no box. You stiff necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. See, you received the law and it was delivered to you, but you did not keep it. You preach and teach the word, but you don't keep the word. You don't obey the word. You want to tell everyone else about the word, but you don't want to obey the very words that come out of your mouth is what it's saying. And that same thing goes on today. The stoning of Stephen. So now they, the, the stoning of Stephen is coming. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. They got angry. They were mad. And they grounded their teeth at him. So they grit their teeth at him. They was grinding them up like, man, because that's what the word will do to you. It will pierce your very soul. It will make you angry because you know right from wrong. But you don't want to face the music. You don't want to tell the truth. You don't want to do the right thing. You want to do the wrong thing. And I'm not talking about, I'm just telling you, this is what it's saying. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. So he looked up and he saw the glory of God. And Yeshua standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. So they, they, it was like, forget that. Ah, we ain't trying to hear nothing you said. And they rushed him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord, Yeshua, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. He did the same thing that Yeshua did. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen did the same thing. Father, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. Basically, the same thing Yeshua said. Father, do not hold their sin against them. Or Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do not punish them. Do not ridicule them. Forgive them, Father. And he fell to sleep or he died. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, chapter 8 later on because, again, I had to talk about um, chapter 7. I had to break it down and go back and study for yourself. But this is what happened in those days. You were persecuted. You were killed be because of your belief in the Christ, your belief in our Heavenly Father. You were killed for that. And it said, so as in the day of Noah, it will be again. And we're in that time. Please go back and study. We're in Acts chapter 7, but we're moving on to chapter 8. Check out my YouTube video, Knowledge the Raven 2468. That's Knowledge, D-A-R-A-V-E-N 2468. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, share the content with somebody. I love y'all. Blessings to y'all. Knowledge.